And it's good to be together with everyone tonight via the electronic media to continue our study of the book of John and noticing the proofs of the deity of Jesus Christ. Now we'll enter into a study in a moment of chapter 18. But first of all, let's remind ourselves of what we did in chapter 17. In that chapter, we saw how that prior to his coming to earth, Jesus existed in glory with the Father. Of course, we've already established that in the first chapter. We see that he also came from the Father, but we see he was sent by the Father. That he had accomplished his Father's will and that he is the means of eternal life. Thus, through his words, the words of the apostles, men can be brought to a saving belief in him. And as was talked about a moment ago by Brett concerning exactly when one's sins are remitted, one can be then added to the church by the Lord himself, Acts 2.47, and grow up into perfection within his spiritual body, which is the church. So we want to continue with what is said in chapter 18. We now see at this point, of course, they're in the garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, that Roman soldiers and the officers of the Jews came to arrest him. So following his prayer, Jesus went with his disciples to that garden. We would simply call it an olive grove. And there is over there today what is called the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, I guess most people know this, but olive trees live even not hundreds of years, but even thousands of years. And some of those trees were alive thousands of years ago that are there present. Today, you can run into those during several places in the Middle East. Judas knew the place because Jesus and his apostles came there often. So Judas leads the soldiers or the officers from the chief priests and Pharisees to this garden and it's at night. So they come with clubs and torches, lanterns have weapons. Makes you wonder sometimes really what they thought was going to happen. But they come, I guess, from their perspective, being fully prepared for whatever might come, come to place. And then we see in the chapter, which I hope everybody has read that our Lord who had complete or full knowledge of everything that was taking place, said to them, that is to the crowd that came to arrest him, whom do you see? And they answered plainly, Jesus of Nazareth. And he does it, as we would say, colloquially, bat an eye in answering. He says, I'm he. And the scripture tells us that Judas, who betrayed him, was standing there with them, with the crowd that came to arrest him. Now, this next part I find rather interesting. Don't know that I have a full explanation of it, but when he said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. He asked them again, who do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he replies again, I told you that I'm he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. And of course, noted here is that this, that the word might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom thou hast given me, I haven't lost any of them. 
Well, Simon Peter still shows his true impetuous reactionary colors. And he draws his sword and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And John is the one that gives us the name of that servant. His name was Malchus. Jesus then said to Peter, you know, put your sword up, sword up, put it in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father hath given me to, to drink? In other words, this is all part of it. Now, I want to pause here and point out, this goes again to show that though the apostles had been with him over three years, day in and day out, seeing all kinds of miracles and hearing him teach, they still did not understand what was truly involved concerning Christ and what he came to do. I think this is another time for us to emphasize in striving to teach the truth to other people. That we think we've taught it well enough for them to get it. But many times we see they don't. We have to continue to teach the same truth over and over again. I would say to anybody that wants to be a teacher of the Bible, for the reasons anyone would want to teach the Bible, or to preach the gospel of Christ and all that the New Testament indicates that to be, that you should never get tired of preaching the truth. Though you may have preached on that same topic or topics many, many times. And maybe people, the same people, have heard you address it many, many times, as well as maybe hearing others do the same thing. That doesn't guarantee they're getting it. So it must be understood that the truth must be taught over and over and over again. And we must not be weary in well-doing. Well, you know, that has to do with teaching too. Teaching the truth is well-doing. And we must not be weary in that as, he, as we must not be weary in other things that pertain to godly living, a righteous living. So now the Roman group of Romans uh, that are there arrested Jesus and we see that they bound him. Now that's covering verses 1 through 12 of Chapter 18 of the book of John. Now we come to that part, verses 13 and 14, where he's taken before Annas. The scripture tells us that Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And it says that Caiaphas was high priest that year. It's also pointed out, John, by inspiration, writes it, that Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient or advantageous for one man to die on behalf of the people. We've already spent time talking about that, and John reminds us of it here. It's important to realize that the high priest and all of his family were Sadducees. So they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in angels. The Sadducees were that sect of the Jews at that time that were the aristocrats. They were very wealthy. And they held the power. And like a lot of folks who are wedded to this present world and the things thereof, they weren't going to give up that power no matter what. So then we have Peter's first denial given to us in verses 15 through 18. You'll notice that um, Peter's following Jesus. And so was another disciple. The Bible tells us, this narrative does, that the other disciple was known to the high priest. And he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. I'm thinking that that tells us, in view of that other disciple actually being John, why he was able 
to enter into the court of the high priest because they knew who he was. But now you'll notice Peter is standing outside the door. And the other disciple went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought in Peter. It's interesting to note that you can have such a person as John. And we know him from the scriptures, from this book, and from the three epistles that he wrote, as well as the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. And see the character of this man. The total and complete devotion to Christ and the gospel message. And yet he had these kinds of connections, but he didn't let them turn him from what he knew to be the truth and the proof that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God. Now there's a servant girl, which usually means a slave girl, who kept the door. And she said to Peter, well, you're, you're one of those that uh, are a disciple. You're one of the disciples. And she puts it to him, aren't you? This is the first time that Peter says, I am not. It doesn't matter nine. This is the man who not very long before was saying, though they all forsake you, I won't. And let me emphasize again, it's very easy in comfortable places where there's no danger to declare our allegiance and our devotion. But um, as was called many back in the American Revolution, he was a sunshine patriot. So when the sun's shining, everything's comfortable. It's uh, easy to do that. But we find out at this time that he's not what he thought he was. We might comment further here. When God tried the faith of Abraham by ordering him to offer up his son Isaac, he passed the test. His faith was put on trial, and he didn't bat an eye. He was ready to kill his son and offer him up a burnt offering to God. Of course, God stayed his hand when he was about to plunge the knife into Isaac and provided a ram caught in the thicket as a sacrifice. Well, as we go through life, once we have been saved from our sins, a humble obedience to the truth. And we're added to the church, as we said in the beginning and in the devotional talk tonight. We may have times that we are a Peter. We may have times that we are like Abraham. But when we continue to live, we have the opportunity to correct those things and learn from them. When all is said and done, what Peter did, if left unrepented of, put him in the same class as Judas Iscariot. But you can see that this man, Peter, was made of much more pure and sterner stuff. And in that, he shared with David the disposition of Mark, that is King David. And that is when confronted with the fact that I have sinned, it's my responsibility, I can't blame it on anybody else, and I'm not going to, he repented of his sin. Now, the fact of the matter is this. When anyone sins, all they can do is repent of it. Of course, they've got to come to grips with the fact they did sin, as David did, no doubt Peter did. But they must do the repenting. They must have the resolve of the heart to turn from that type of attitude and action. So it's important to understand that here. Peter, we're not through with Peter yet. The Lord said, you'll deny me three times. So Peter says, uh, no, I'm not a disciple. Well, the servants and the officers 
were standing there. They had made a fire. It was cold. And they were warming themselves. And Peter was there warming himself with them. I think it's important to understand that regardless of who you are, evil companionship corrupts good morals. The old Lord Moses said to the Jews, I shall not follow a multitude to do evil. Well, I, you're not supposed to follow one person to do evil. Why is it made statement made that way? Because it's easier to go with the flow. And it will cause you many times to go and do that, which you know absolutely is not right. Now, Peter knew better than this. But he's standing around. He has no one there to encourage him to do right. And so he flunks the test here. Then we come to verses 19 through 24. And here's where the high priest is questioning Jesus. He asked the Lord about himself. And he asked the Lord about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus is very bold and says, I, I've spoken openly to the world. Now, that's one thing we ought to keep in mind as members of our Lord's spiritual body. We, I, I used to have a radio program many years ago, and I would make it clear on that radio program, we welcome your questions, your comments, even your disagreements. We are open and above board. That's the way we ought to be in the church. What have we got to be afraid of when it comes to being questioned about what we believe and why we do what we do and why we oppose what we oppose. And it's very interesting that it's Peter who says that we're to be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that is within us with meekness and fear. That reason in English there comes from the Greek word apologia, which means be ready to make a defense of what you believe. Many times the gospel has been taught by Christians defending what they teach. Sometimes people don't realize that when you're in a debate or a discussion where two sides are represented, at least, that the one advocating the truth and defending it is doing a great deal of teaching to anybody that's listening. He said, I've spoken openly in the world. I taught in the synagogues. I taught in the temple. That's where all the Jews are, are gathering. And then he plainly says, I, I didn't speak anything in secret. So why are you questioning me? Go and question those that heard me. Those that heard what I said. They know what I said. And they can tell you. Well, this incensed one of the officers that was there. And he slapped Jesus with the palm of his hand. And scolded him saying you shouldn't answer the high priest that way. That's not the way to answer him. Well, you know, you don't get ahead of the Lord. Imagine this man on the day of judgment when he stands before Christ, given the count of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. And he looks up into the eyes of the one that he slapped because that one told the truth. We can only hope such a man as that repented of his sins and obeyed the gospel, and lived faithful. Jesus answers here and says, now, if I've spoken wrongly, then bear witness of the wrong. That is a marvelous and wonderful statement and a good motto for every one of Christ's followers, Christians, in other words, to have. If I've done wrong, where's the proof of it? One reason we're commanded to prove all things, hold fast that which is good, for Thessalonians 5.21. But as I've often taught, you've heard me say this, that anytime people are dishonest at heart and you oppose their error many times, if not all the time, to one extent or the other, they will attack you personally because they cannot answer the truth that you're teaching. In fact, members of the church are going to take the Great Commission seriously of going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Who take very soberly and seriously what Jude said when he said uh, he was contending for the faith, making a defense. 
we ought to realize that's going to happen. Vaccinate yourself against it. And thus, don't think that everybody you teach or when you're defending a practice or doctrine that is taught, being that it's the truth, that people are going to appreciate it. A great many people won't appreciate it. And dishonest people can act in all sorts of terrible ways. Anybody that has taught other people for any length of time in various places in this world knows what that's like to deal with people who will not meet the arguments, but they try to tear you down personally because they cannot refute the truth. It's not unusual, not unusual at all. And Christians need to be prepared for that. So Jesus said, if I've spoken wrongly, then bear witness of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? Turn the fellow's actions right around on him. This man no doubt knew the situation with Jesus and his life, the teaching he had done. And it reminds us of the Apostle Paul when many, many years later, he would be slapped. When he responded in a way that they didn't like, which ought to tell us that's the way they dealt with people regularly, who crossed them. And Paul let him have it right back. Why smitest me, thou whited wall? Well, you uh, are a person who's just white on the outside. You're just whitewashed. Now, Annas then, nothing else is said here about this, sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest, and this brings us down to verse 25. Also, it brings us down to Peter's second and third denials. Now, Simon Peter, as I we left him a little bit ago, was standing and warming himself. And they say, well, you're one of his disciples. Peter just blatantly comes out and says, I am not. And one of the servants, a slave, no doubt of a high priest, in view of the word that's used in the Greek, a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, by the way, so we're told here, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Well, remember, they're out there with lanterns and torches and so forth, and it's dark. They don't have everything lit up like we do today. And so got all that hubbub going on. They they think they saw him. They're, they're not absolutely sure. This may explain why that they ask these questions like they do. Of course, Peter therefore denied it again. What happens? The rooster crowed. Then we come to verses 28 through 40. Jesus was taken now before Pilate, the Roman procurator. So they've got him handcuffed, if you want to call it that. And they take him from Caiaphas to what is the official residence of the Roman procurator, Pilate. And they've been up all night now. It's early morning. And to avoid uh, their ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter into the palace because they would be defiled. And uh, that would mean they couldn't eat the Passover. Well, what happens? Pilate goes out to them. And he says to them, now, what is this accusation you're bringing against this man? It's very interesting when you study the Romans. And they were about as corrupt as people could be, and someone like Pilate certainly was. But when they dealt with things officially, many times they were very particular about following the law. I don't mean the law of Moses. I mean Roman law. 
So they answer if uh, this uh, man were not an evil doer, we would not have brought him to you. So why do you think we brought him? You think we brought somebody here that's innocent? And Pilate said, well, you take him yourself and you judge him according to your law. Again, this tends to show that Pilate would bow out about anything. He might have the smell of putting him on the spot. And uh, it's early in the morning. Maybe he hadn't gotten up yet. He might say today he hadn't had one cup of coffee, much less two. So you take him. It gets, me out, gets him out of my hair. Well, the Jews said, we can't do that. We're not permitted to put a person to death, and they couldn't of their own volition and desires. Pilate went into the palace, and he summoned Jesus, said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, well, now, are you saying that because you have concluded that on your own research, or did others tell you about me? I can almost see Pilate saying, well, my, what now? And he says, I'm not a Jew. Your own nation and chief priest have delivered you to me. And they've indicated they wouldn't bring somebody to me unless he was uh, guilty of something. And obviously, they want to kill you. So what have you done? And the Lord answers and says, very quickly, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, it'd be interesting to know all the thoughts that went through Pilate's mind at that time. Our human curiosity makes us wonder, because remember, we're not dealing with a Jew and one that even has a corrupted view of the Old Testament. We're dealing with a pagan. He said, in my kingdom or this world, and this is something that Pilate will at least understand. Then my soldiers or my servants would uh, would fight. And they would fight that I might be delivered from the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this realm or this world. So Pilate says, you are a king. Well, Jesus answered, well, you say correctly that I am king. To this end was I born. I've come into the world for this reason. And notice, he's come into the world to bear witness to the truth. And he says, everyone that hears the truth hears my voice. Well, we get a deep insight into his thinking, Pilate's thinking, when he says, well, what is truth? Makes me think of the way our secular society is operating today. They talk about your truth, my truth, his truth, her truth, their truth. People are just doing their best to get around the idea that truth is just what a thing is. Truth corresponds with reality, period. It's objective. That means it doesn't make any difference whether you're male or female, whether you're old or young, rich or poor, whatever ethnicity you are, whatever job you hold, or you don't have one. Truth is truth and always will be truth, regardless of what men may say or do. That's a point that has been missed a great deal in this world, and I think you will find, if you want to do the study, that it's at the root of a great many problems in the government, politics in general, in the schools, higher education in particular, because most of the time people think that truth is relative and subjective. But is it changes? It's what you think it is. Thus, the idea of your truth, my truth, their truth, and so on. But that's not the case. 
Truth is just what a thing is, corresponds with reality. So Pilate now goes back out to the Jews. And he says, maybe thinking this fellow's crazy or something, but he says, I, I don't find any guilt in him. Well, it's interesting that he said further that now you Jews have a custom that I should release someone for you at Passover. Again, I think he's trying to get out of having to condemn Jesus. He says, do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? Well, to me, if he had any hope whatsoever of having those folks say, yes, release him, he wouldn't have said the king of the Jews describing Jesus because that would do nothing but incense then, which they couldn't get much more incense than they already were. So they cry out saying, oh, no, not this man. Give us Barabbas. And John adds to us that Barabbas was a robber, one who had made insurrection. And that's where we are when we come down to the close of this chapter. So let's review it for a moment. Judas, of course, in fulfillment of the Lord's prophecy, betrays the Lord. Again, in fulfillment of prophecy, of the disciples with him, he, he lost no one. We see the Lord's miraculous powers could be substantiated easily by investigation of the healed right ear of the servant of the high priest. I might pause and add this to that. You know, when they first came and Jesus identified himself, the second time he said, I told you I'm him, uh, let these go. When Peter jumped up and did what he did, Peter could have been arrested. And I'm sure in the short time, Malchus was without his ear. That was a very painful thing. But then the Lord heals his ear. Now, if they're going to charge Peter with cutting off his ear, how are they going to prove it? They can't. Nothing's ever brought up at all that anybody ever tried to do so. I would love to have talked to Malchus after that happened. So as the Lord has spoken, we see in our study we just finished that Peter denied the Lord three times before the cock crew. Now the Jews did not, we may say in fact they could not, state to Pilate an accusation against him. Pilate carefully examines him, finds no guilt in him, and his real desire is simply to release Jesus. And that brings us up to chapter 19, and we have enough time to at least get into this. In verses 1 through 16 of this chapter, we see Jesus being sentenced to be crucified. Now, what Pilate did to him, or had the Roman soldiers do it, a scourging was not a, a mild whipping or even a bad whipping with sticks or a switch or something like that. It was a terrible thing. Many men died from being scourged. They would take what would be like a whip, called later on, or at least people refer to that kind of thing later on, as a cat of nine tails. How many of those particular whips were on that one stick that held them? If that was the case, it was on a stick. They may have been just holding the ends of the strips that made up each little belt, if you want to call it that. But they would take, and at the end of those, it would be striking the body. They would tie pieces of bone or rock or lead pieces. And they would uh, take a person, stretch them out to where their back would be very tight. 
And the fellow that's doing this, remember, is not some sort of novice. He knows how to create a terrible amount of pain. So he would strike him. And this would, after the whelps were made and they kept hitting them, it literally opened up great cuts all over his back besides the terrible bruising. And as I said, many times people died from scourging. And blood loss could be such that a person would be a terribly weak. And it's my personal view. That's one reason that he later fell beneath the load of the cross. Because he just seemed so weak, he could not bear it. But at this time, we see the soldiers weaving a crown of thorns and putting it on his head. And you know they didn't lightly do it. They made it out of thorns for a reason. They arrayed him in a purple robe, and they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they hit him on the face. <clears throat> they hit him on the face. Now, usually this was done not just as punishment, but as a last effort to say, hey, you will confess. We don't know all the reasons why he had him scourged. It was customary to do it too, so they did it. So he comes back out to the people again, but his pilot does. He says, now I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. How can a man who found no guilt in a person like this put him through a scourging, the mockery, all that kind of thing? I wish we could understand that in the Roman Empire, life was cheap. I wish people today would realize that throughout this world, life is still very cheap. I think sometimes we've just in America been so insulated from problems that most of the world's had to endure and continues in places to endure. But now Jesus comes out and he's wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and he must look terrible. Pilate declares, behold the man. In Latin, that's ecce homo. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, what did they do? They renewed their cry, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate says, you take him yourself and crucify him. Again, he says, for I find no guilt in him. If you want to know what a consummate politician is, the scripture records one right here. He has done everything he could to get out from under saying, I'm a Roman procurator. You're not going to put this man to death because I cannot find any guilt in him. He wouldn't do that. He does not want a rebellion in his hands. He's afraid of what will happen. Oftentimes people are afraid to do what's right because of the consequences that are there for them. Christians can't do that. There's much in the New Testament that tells us and vaccinates us against persecution, even dying. Good example of that is Stephen, the first Christian martyr who followed the example of Christ and died, saying, lay not this sin to their charge. But the Jews now answer, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die. Why? Because he made himself out to be the son of God. He was a son of God. He is the son of God. Glorified now at the right hand of God. Following his resurrection and ascension. He was the son of God then. The proofs were in. They knew what he had done. They knew the miracles he had done. They were so dishonest and hardened. So worldly that they tried to attribute his miracles to the power of Satan. Jesus refuted that, you'll remember, by saying, well, Satan doesn't fight against Satan. He's got better sense than that. The kingdom divided against itself can't stand. 
But when Pilate heard this, notice that he was the more afraid, the more afraid, more afraid. That means he was afraid, and now he's more afraid than he was. This says again much about Pilate. Well, he goes back into the palace, and he says to Jesus, where are you from? Now Jesus doesn't give him an answer. He's mute. Pilate said, you don't speak to me? Don't you know I have power or authority to release you? Or I have that same power and authority to crucify you. Jesus here says something that we won't have time to do, to go into tonight, but it's very important. He says, whatever authority you have over me was given to you from above. And for this reason, he who delivered you or me to you has the greater sin. First of all, look at the last part of it. Some sins are greater than other sins, at least in the consequences that follow them. This man, Pilate, was in a part of a government that could not see it ever being defeated or anybody being greater than the power of Rome. And he was afraid always of offending Caesar. And thus he responds in this way. So he makes efforts to release the Lord. The Jews cry out, if you release this man, you're not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Well, I'm going to pause here because the time's about up. Go ahead and read the rest of that if you haven't already. You might want to do a little reading about Pilate. You have to do it in secular history, but you might want to look at that and think about it. Before we go, having studied these marvelous things the Lord did for us, we never could do for ourselves to save us from sin. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Holy Father, we're thankful we could study these things that our Lord went through because he loved us, because thou dost love us. Help us, Father, to appreciate it more. Help us as thy children to love thee more, to be more faithful, to truly fight the fight of faith, and to be willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. Help us to lift up our voice and speak the truth, no matter the consequences. Bless us, Father, to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, to always walk the straight and narrow path of righteousness. We pray it all in the blessed name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.